My name is Soraya, and you are listening to Wild Roots. In this episode of Wild Roots, we will explore the wilds of Congo with herpetologist and evolutionary biologist Dr. Eli Greenbaum. To better understand perhaps the richest biodiverse place on the planet, we follow Greenbaum into remote forests and wetlands in a race to discover and rediscover Congo's dwindling wildlife before we lose them forever. Dr. Greenbaum braves multiple threats in the Congo, including silverback mountain gorilla, venom-spitting cobras, the occasional surprise of wild elephants, bouts of infections including malaria, typhoid fever, and teenage rebel forces slinging AK-47s. In this episode, we will discuss his book, Emerald Labyrinth on his early journeys as a biologist in the Congo, current threats to the loss of Congo's biodiversity, as well as promising efforts to save perhaps the richest living place on the planet. So join us today as we journey into the Congo. So could you start off, Dr. Greenbaum, by telling us a little bit about who you are and what you do? Okay, so um, I am an associate professor of evolutionary genetics at the University of Texas at El Paso, and I also serve as director of the UTEP, UT El Paso uh, Biodiversity Collections. Um, So since 2007, my research has been focused in Central Africa, mostly in Democratic Republic of Congo. And I'm a herpetologist, so I'm focused on amphibian and reptile uh, taxonomy, evolutionary relationships, and other aspects of their behavior, ecology, and conservation. So I am really big on trying to convey the big picture of biodiversity and to really help people wrap their minds around the intricacies of biodiversity. Um, So could you give your standpoint on why it is important to preserve biodiversity in general? Sure. So, um, you know, essentially the argument I I make in the book um, is really from multiple standpoints. Um, But the, the main thing that I think is relevant to every person on the earth is that the global ecosystem, which includes all of the plant, animal, and microbial species on the planet, is really poorly understood. And we are part of that global ecosystem. And if enough species go extinct, and nobody knows what that magic number is, but we're definitely racing towards that unknown number right now, um, we might be next because uh, we are part of the global ecosystem. We do benefit from the biodiversity in a myriad of ways. They give us uh, food, all kinds of um, consumable products that we use every day. They are responsible uh, for the relatively stable climate that we enjoy on planet Earth. Um, and w- without that biodiversity, uh, the future of humanity is is really um, 
uh, questionable. I would like to briefly reference E.O. Wilson's Half Earth book, which I'm sure you've heard about. I have. He talks about how much biodiversity actually survives today, quoting that the more species humanity extinguishes, the more new ones are discovered. But this actually only adds to the estimate of the magnitude of destruction underway. So because there are so many species out there that have not been discovered yet, we're actually losing a lot more than we know of. I mean, the magnitude of uh, rate of loss is much greater than, than we can even conceive of, probably, at this point. Yes, that's absolutely true. Um, you know, there are definitely things going extinct as we speak right now. Um, I think I provided a statistic in the book from the uh, website mongabay.com. Mm-hmm. that uh, quotes more than 100 tropical species go extinct every day. Um, so as we are speaking, something is probably going extinct as somebody is chopping down the rainforest or burning it away, or climate change is um, changing the habitat uh, to such a degree that that species can't live there anymore. And yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, we are definitely losing biodiversity before we have uh, a chance to get out there and actually discover it and bring it to the attention of the world so that some kind of conservation plan can be put in place to try to protect it. Yeah. I remember learning from you while taking your genetics course that uh, a lot of the Western technologies actually contribute in a way to some of the corruption that happens in places like Congo, particularly the mining of coltan which is a precious metal that's often used in a lot of westernized technology, uh, smart technology, such as our cell phones. Could you elaborate a little bit on the mining effects in Congo? Sure. Well, you just mentioned uh, coltan, which is kind of um, the term that's used for tantalum that's mined in Congo. Mm -hmm. And, you know, about 7 or 8% of the world's supply uh, actually comes from Congo, and this is one of the the metals that's responsible for making your cell phone vibrate in your pocket. So you might actually have a little piece of Congo in your pocket right now without even knowing it. But the problem is, is that the companies that need those rare earth metals often aren't very responsible about where they obtain it from. And in Congo, uh, coltan and other Uh, rare metals, including gold and diamonds and other things, um, are mined under terrible conditions, um, often with child laborers and uh, under conditions where armed militia are terrorizing the local population into doing that very dangerous mining work to get those metals that are then sold on the black market and eventually end up in our cell phones and other electronic devices. So... Mining uh, is just one of many ways in which, um, you know, unregulated environmental destruction happens in in Congo because really Mm -hmm. there's nobody um, in charge of those illegal mining operations. No one is doing any kind of environmental impact assessment to see um, how those mining activities are going to destroy the natural environment and actually poison it as well. So in the case of gold, uh, they have to use uh, mercury to um, uh, separate the gold during the mining process. And that can be uh, very, very toxic to the water supply, not only for the plants and the animals, but for people as well. Um, So if you look at, you know, these areas where they have gone into mine for these um, rare metals, it's absolutely destroyed. It it almost looks like... um, you know, mm-hmm. a Mars landscape compared to the, the rest of the surrounding region, which is so lush yeah. and verdant. And that's got to be a pretty incredible contrast. Absolutely. In the Emerald Labyrinth, you describe quite well the incredibly complex history of the Congo, which you weave quite nicely alongside your adventures exploring Congo's faunal diversity. Could you elaborate a little bit on that really complex history and how it has affected Congo's biodiversity. Sure. So, uh, you know, Congo has a a very troubling history. 
Um, you know, there was this guy named uh, King Leopold the the second of Belgium, which was a very young country in the late 19th century when he came to power. And he was sort of an evil genius where he recognized um, that other countries, including um, England and France, um, uh, Portugal, for example, that had um, colonies in Africa and other areas of the world, were getting a huge amount of profit from their, their colonies, um, from agricultural activities, mining, um, extracting other resources. And the key ingredient uh, to that uh, success, if you will call it that, at least financially, was um, uh, you know almost a slave labor um, from the, the people uh, that were in those colonies. Now, some countries, acted a little bit better than others, but uh, King Leopold uh, realized if he could convince these other European powers and the United States uh, to give him access to this huge area that we now call the Democratic Republic of Congo, um, he would be able to get very wealthy indeed. And that's what he did. He, he basically um, had a lobbying campaign where he convinced Europe, and especially the United States, that he was going to take over this huge territory uh, for scientific endeavors, to, quote, bring civilization to the natives. Um, it would be a free trade zone. Everyone would be welcome. And the United States was actually the, the first country uh, to recognize Leopold's claim to the Congo. And then once they did that, everybody else followed suit. And once he got control over it, then uh, the charade went away. He was really after money by any means necessary. And he forms this really nasty, almost a militia called the Force Publique that um, terrorized large areas of, of Congo and, uh, you know, by the turn of, of the 20th century, I believe they had killed about half of the Congolese population wow. in their quest for greed. Again, in E.O. Wilson's Half Earth Project, uh, which is a plan to saving our biosphere by devoting half of the earth back to nature by focusing on these really rich biodiverse uh, hotspots. And he mentions the Congo Basin as being one of these regions. And um, actually, in, in your book, Emerald Labyrinth, you uh, quoted about 2.6% of the Congo forest is actually lost, which was actually pretty surprising to me. Uh, compared to other tropical areas of the world, you know, like Madagascar, for example, which has lost 95% of its mm -hmm. forest, the Congo Basin uh, overall is, is doing pretty well, especially in Democratic Republic of Congo, where most of the, the Congo Basin forest occurs just because of the size of the country, which is the size of Western Europe. Um, there has been some deforestation, but it's been relatively limited. So it's, it's relatively in, intact compared to other areas of the world and even other areas in, in Africa uh, because... Um, the infrastructure of the country is really bad. So, for example, uh, forests that are relatively close to the Congo River, which is sort of this uh, major artery that boats can go up and down uh, through the northwestern part of the country and elsewhere, uh, they've, they've had a little bit of damage because you can kind of chop down a tree, drag it to the boat, and then once it's on the boat, you can take it down the river and eventually it can go to market. But in many other areas of the country, the roads are so bad that it would just be impossible to chop down a really valuable mm -hmm. tree and then try to take this huge thing out of this remote area because the roads um, are not maintained and whenever the, the rainy season comes, they just become an absolute mess. As I learned, unfortunately, firsthand, uh, many a time getting stuck in the mud and uh, <laughs> yeah. breakdowns and, and everything else. Yeah. So, uh, so in a way, 
Congo's sheer remoteness and density actually protects itself from this onslaught of destruction, or at least slows it down. Yes, well, that's one factor. So another factor is this idea that some have called uh, um, gunpoint conservation, where Mm. uh, because of the political instability and warfare that has plagued Congo in recent years, um, nobody in their right mind is going to try to go in there right now and, you know, build up the infrastructure to extract uh, those those timber resources in the most remote areas of Congo. Although um, that is starting to change, the Chinese in recent years have um, started collaborations with the Congolese government to improve roads and other infrastructure. Um, and I think the Congolese people are benefiting from that. But it's a double-edged sword because it also may allow um, better access to those resources and cause environmental damage in the future. So we sort of touched on the importance of biodiversity preservation in general, but specifically, why should people care about protecting the Congo? Oh, well, there's so many different reasons, but one of the main ones I already touched on, right? So Mm -hmm. there's an enormous amount of biodiversity in the Congo Basin and even in the Albertine Rift Mountains of Eastern Congo, which is quite different from the rest of the country. And it's all part of the same global ecosystem, including humans. So if that biodiversity is damaged, it will inevitably damage humanity. But one of the other um, really interesting things I think about the the Congo Basin Forest is that it's part of the global climate system. So I talk about the so-called teleconnections in the book, and everyone's familiar with the El Nino effect, right, where you have uh, changes in ocean temperatures that can make it either hotter or colder or wetter or drier in different areas of the world. And the Congo Basin rainforest um, can actually have an effect on rainfall in North America. Um, So they've done some really interesting studies showing how tropical rainforests in the Amazon and Congo and in Asia can actually have an effect on rainfall patterns in the United States. So if deforestation really starts to become a serious issue um, in, in the Congo Basin and we already are losing some rainforest every year, Um, that will eventually um, affect rainfall patterns uh, in North America. And it's already having a small effect and it will get larger uh, as time continues. Now, the other thing I kind of talk about when I'm, you know, discussing, well, you know, we've found all these new species of toads in the Congo Basin, and people are like, well, that's cool, but I don't really care <laughs> yeah. about a new species of toad in the Congo Basin. Why, why should I care about that? And the reason why I think people should care about that and other species uh, that, that live in the Congo Basin is because we might be able to get some really important biomedical compounds out of them. So a lot of people don't know that toads have these little glands called paratoid glands behind their eyes, right. and they secrete toxins, poison. And that's uh, evolved as a defense against predators so that predators have to think twice before they eat a toad because they might get poisoned and die. Well, those um, toxins in those paratoid glands, they've studied just a very small percentage of those toxins in toads from around the world, and they have found amazing things. They have analgesic effects. They have anti-tumor effects. Uh, They they have antimicrobial effects, which is going to become a very serious problem in the coming years as antibiotic resistance becomes more of an issue. Absolutely. Um, You name it. You you can think of any human malady that you want, and there might be a toxin secreted by one of these toads that might be able to treat it or even cure it. Um, So that's just one of many examples. Of course, there are uh, complex venom and and biochemistry associated with uh, snakes and scorpions. Every time we discover a new species in a place Mm -hmm. like the Congo, uh, there is the potential 
for benefit to humanity in that. So given its biodiversity, it really is such a treasure trove in so many ways. Absolutely. So as a biologist myself, you can really feel and see how underappreciated or undervalued field work is. And E.O. Wilson talks about this importance of boots on the ground kind of work in biology, which just reminds me of the kind of work that you do in the Congo. And he talks about how serious it is to have such a lack of taxonomist uh, conducting field work because these are the ones that are really making the discoveries about nature and solving genetic mysteries that are so important to our understanding of where we stand in the face of nature and nature's destruction. So um, could you talk a, a little bit about the importance of your taxonomic work and what you've observed in Congo as far as continuing field work there by both natives and biologists like yourself? Sure. Well, let me just quickly comment about, um, you know, what E.O. Wilson said about fewer and fewer taxonomists and his boots on the ground comment. You know, um, back in the middle of the 20th century, one of the most prominent African herpetologists uh, in the world was a guy named Arthur Loveridge, who was originally uh, British, but he worked at, at Harvard in the Museum of, of Comparative Zoology, which has been there for a really long time. And now there are fewer and fewer and fewer taxonomists and people like me who utilize natural history specimens in museum collections to do this very important type of taxonomic work. And the reason for that is that over time, that type of work has um, become undervalued because nowadays, uh, you know, people want to focus on using supercomputers to answer really big questions in biology with huge data sets that a human brain would never be able to uh, calculate on its own. And those types of analyses are indeed very exciting and very appropriate and uh, should be valued. But when we ignore you know, this hundreds of years of history of specimen-based research and, and taxonomy as we are now, we are losing a really important knowledge base as more and more taxonomists retire without having a replacement because those people who are focused on taxonomy can't find employment because it's not valued as much anymore. So, so the thing is, is, you know, taxonomy is really, really important for many, many reasons, but probably the most urgent one, especially in relation to my work in Congo, is that the biodiversity extinction crisis is happening right now. So this is really, in the coming years, our last chance to document the life on our planet that is so poorly known even today. And the other thing that I kind of think about, this is a little bit science fiction-y, but one of the other things I think about in relation to natural history collections and museums and the type of taxonomy research that I and many others around the world do, is that the biodiversity extinction crisis is already upon us. And as more and more of these species go extinct, people of the future will only know of their existence because a taxonomist took the time to go out and find it, um, collect natural history specimens, bring them back to the laboratory to study them, name them as a new species so that the scientific community and global community at large knows of its existence. And then... Decades from now, if we can get our act together as a human species and uh, reverse the horrible trends of environmental def uh, uh, destruction and global climate change that are happening right now, it might be possible to use those natural history specimens and the genomic DNA uh, that is associated with them to clone them and put them back in the wild sort of bring them back from extinction. But the only way we can do that is if taxonomists are allowed to, to do the, the type of work uh, that I describe in the book. What are some of the promising 
endeavors you've observed in the Congo that makes you hopeful about its preservation? Yeah, so one of the things um, that happened in the last few months is Congo had an election. And usually <laughs> um, uh, when there's an election in Congo, there is trouble. And there was a little bit of trouble, um, but for the most part, it was a peaceful, democratic transition of power. Um, so that gives me hope because you know the people of Congo really need a lot of help um, in, in multiple ways. So that was definitely encouraging um, uh, to see that. Uh, the other thing that, that um, uh, I have been lucky enough uh, to be involved with over the last few years is I'm uh, advising a couple graduate students at the University of Kisangani. Um, so cool. one is a master's student and one is a PhD student. They're very, very passionate about herpetology. So nice. they are going to be uh, the, the future herpetologists for their country. And uh, that is, is very, very nice to see. And, and actually, one of the guys that I've been working with uh, for over a decade now, um, he's a little bit older. You, you would say he's a non-traditional student. He's uh, in his early 50s now. Uh, but he is also um, uh, going back to school to try to uh, get a degree in, in biology and uh, have a, a, a greater contribution to science in his country. Wow, so, how cool. Yeah, yeah. That is really so all, cool. of, all of that is, is very encouraging. And, um, you know, I'm very hopeful that, uh, you know, the Congolese Wildlife Authority, this organization called ICCN in Congo, uh, is recognizing the work that we're doing and will use the information about where these new species to science and where these really rare species occur and prioritize their, their conservation efforts. Because a lot of conservation work in Congo, just as it is in other areas of Africa and around the world, is really kind of biased towards large mammals. And in mm -hmm. Africa- in That's Africa, everywhere. <laughs> yeah. And in Africa, probably rightfully so, because uh, elephants are in trouble, lion are in trouble, all the large mammals that you think of uh, in, in Africa are uh, threatened with extinction, their populations are declining, uh, definitely the priority to, should be to them. But we can't ignore uh, some of the smaller things like birds, amphibians, reptiles, fish, um, even plants and invertebrates. Those all need to uh, be part of a conservation program as well. So it's really very, very satisfying when we go to an area and we document the presence of a very rare species or perhaps a species that hasn't been seen for 60 years, as we have in some cases. Or yes, find, which I was things. just about to ask you about. Mm -hmm. can't imagine how it must feel to not only discover new species, but come across species that have not been seen since the middle of the last century. I mean, that's got to be pretty incredible. Yes, it's very exciting, um, and especially so because a lot of these species that were described by Belgian herpetologists in the 1940s mm -hmm. and 1950s and sometimes even earlier, um, they, in some cases, they didn't do a very good job of describing exactly what they look like. Um, very rarely did they publish photographs of these things, and even more rarely were they in color. Um, so when we do rediscover these things that haven't been seen since the middle of the 20th century, and wow, they're really colorful looking or that's incredible, you know, have some kind of color pattern that you weren't expecting and being able to photograph that and document it, it's, it's very gratifying. It's, it's, it's really exciting. So I know that you're making trips to the Congo on a yearly basis. Is that what you are still doing? Yes, um, I, I usually go once a year, although I was supposed to be uh, heading there this month, but because of the Ebola outbreak, mm -hmm. um, that is not happening. And for your listeners who want to know more about Ebola, I didn't have a chance to look at it myself yet, but National Geographic uh, just published a big story about uh, Ebola. And um, it's very, very serious because mm -hmm. it's 
We're getting close to the one-year anniversary since the outbreak started. There's no end in sight, and it's yeah. spreading. I know. And it's not far uh, from Goma, which is right on the border uh, with uh, Rwanda, and it's a city of about a million people. If just one person gets through to Goma and it starts spreading in a city that large, it could very quickly become a global pandemic and spiral out of control. Yeah, we talk about these sort of things such as pandemics in biology quite a bit as, as being real possibilities. And, and it's sort of upon us right now. And it's uh, pretty scary. Yeah, it is. It is but. very scary, especially since, you know, for certain types of Ebola, the fatality rate can be as high as 90 percent. Wow. Yeah, it absolutely is a real threat. Mm hmm. So I'm going to play this very interesting audio that you shared with me, and it's a pretty interesting one, so be prepared, listeners. And uh, after I play it, um, you can give a little bit of a description of what we're hearing. Pretty interesting audio. I'm pretty sure my listeners will be interested in learning what it actually was. Yeah, so that was from a, a Hyrax. So that's H uh, Y R A X, and um, yeah, I mean it basically looks like a, a little beaver, but they're kind of distantly related to elephants, and they just call to each other um, at night uh, in areas where where they occur. And um, it's it's really haunting. It, it almost sounds like uh, you know a witch screaming or something. But it's just this little cute little mammal that's just uh, uh, calling out for for buddies or whatever it's doing. Um, and then in the background, you can also hear um, tree frogs calling. So uh, tree frogs in the the genus Leptopelis, um, they're calling for mates in the background as well. So I was kind of standing at a stream looking for these tree frogs to record the mating call of those. And I had my little recorder out. And then when this hyrax started screaming pretty close to where I was, um, I just thought, well, you know, let me get a little bit of uh, audio of, of this. Pretty neat. So while you are not exploring the wilds of Congo in search of exotic herpetofauna, how do you like to connect to nature? Is there a special connection that you have made in nature or an animal or anything you'd like to share? Well, I guess I, I have to say, I mean, I'm pretty close to uh, my uh, two Chihuahua dogs. So uh, I guess I, I do have a soft spot for, for dogs. But, um, you know, as far as wild animals, um, I live in Las Cruces, New Mexico now, and um, it's, it's in an area that has been relatively recently developed, but there are still really sort of wild and untamed areas very close uh, to my house. And it's just really nice uh, to see different types of wildlife that, that come by every once in a while. And I think probably the coolest thing was there seemed to be a mating pair of great horned owls Aww. that were roosting in my neighbor's tree uh, for several uh, for several days in a row. And it was just really spectacular because right at dusk, they would take off to go hunting. And it's just such a, you know, impressive, large bird uh, that you don't really expect to see living in the middle of the desert, but yet there it is. Dr. Eli Greenbaum is also a two-time National Geographic Explorer with a popular science blog titled Congo Quest for New Species featured on National Geographic's Open Explorer website. 
His book, Emerald Labyrinth, A Scientist's Adventures in the Jungles of Congo, was honored as one of the top 10 biology books of 2017 by Forbes magazine, and has become one of my new favorites. As exotic as Greenbaum's quest to discover new species in the Congo may seem, Dr. Greenbaum doesn't forget to also honor native and local wildlife closer to home, as all species have their place in the intricate biosphere in which we all live. As Greenbaum states in his extraordinary narrative, the stunningly beautiful forests of Congo are disappearing faster than their biological secrets can be revealed. We must not forget that according to the fossil record, our ancestors and closest living relatives, the chimpanzees, bonobos, and gorillas origins reveal that the Congo forests are, in fact, our ancestral home and our wild roots.